Dear Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for everyone that's here and for just this day that we can celebrate you and, and spending time with you, Lord, and uh, worshiping you and studying your word. Lord, we pray that you would be here. Uh, we know that you're in us. We pray that you'd be amongst us, Lord, and that you would move during this worship time, that it wouldn't just be us singing or us performing, so to say, but it would all of us together would just be gathered together as one body, worshiping you, giving you praise and honor, Lord. We don't sing these songs just to sing them, but we sing these songs to you, Lord. We, we want them to direct our hearts and our minds to focus on you and forgetting about the chaos of this world and in in our lives and what's going on in each and every one of them. And we just lay it at your feet and we want to focus on you and give and just give you the praise and honor that you are so due, Lord, that you're worthy of. And we could never give you enough, but we want to do our best to this morning. And so we ask that you would bless this time and we pray this in your mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen.
endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. And for the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. We sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, we sing praise, sing it out forever. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us. To the setting sun, His love endures forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. We sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, we sing praise.
ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you
sing it out. I want. I want to know you. Let your spirit overwhelm me. Let your presence overtake my heart. I want to know you. Let your spirit Thank you that we are blessed and privileged to be called Christians, followers of you, disciples of yours, Jesus. And my prayer this morning is that not a single person would leave this building today without having been touched by your spirit. So I pray, Lord, right now for anyone who has hard hearts, I pray for anyone who has walls around their heart that are keeping you from coming in, keeping you from speaking. Lord, I pray that you would speak to them right now. Let them know how much you love them, how much you care for them, and that they can be real with you. They can open their hearts up to you, Lord, and you will never let them down. You will never fail them. Lord, we ask that together as a body this morning that you would speak to us. Lord. so much. Pastor Craig and his family are out of town. Uh, they're in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, 
where it's a really horrible weather, um, like 70 degrees, 75 degrees, in the 70s, and I know, it's, it's so, they're having a horrible time. I'm just kidding. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be speaking this morning, um, and uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be uh, going in chapter 15, starting in verse 11, so Luke 15:11. And the title today is The Prodigal. As you turn there, um, probably one of the most popular parables in the Bible is the parable of the prodigal son. It's a parable of love, grace, forgiveness, redemption. Uh, It deals with the person who walks away from God, as well as the attitude of those who stay with the Lord and work hard for the Lord. Uh, In fact, the main reason Jesus gave this parable was to rebuke the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees were like, why would you go and preach to sinners? Why would you go and preach to you know, the prostitutes and the tax collectors and, and the, the lower folk, right? And so he's, he gives the parable to them to compare their attitude towards those that, are, that walk away from the Lord, those that are, know that they're sinners, and when they come back to the Lord. Um, in this parable, one son takes his inheritance early from his father and then wastes on the pleasures of this world. The other son stays and works hard for the father. And for his interests. When the rebellious son is humbled and returns home, the father welcomes him and throws him a big party, while the son who had stayed home becomes hurt and angry, feeling that he deserves a party for himself because of all of his hard work. And what does his younger brother deserve, right? He's he's the screw up little brother, and yet the father is is uh, is throwing a party for him because he returned. And so Jesus is comparing this son to the Pharisees who thought themselves better and deserved more praise and honor than pretty much any other person did. But most people relate to the more rebellious son who returned humbly to the Lord. Jesus gave this parable to rebuke the Pharisees and other prideful religious leaders, but also to serve as an example of the Father's heart to both the rebellious and the faithful. I don't really want to focus on the sons today, though. We're going to take a different look at this parable. But we're going to focus on the father and how he handled the situation and how it can apply to us as well. Now, in the parable, we're going to read it in just a few seconds. But in the parable, the father represents who? Anyone know? God, all right? Or Jesus, but God. But he's also a dad with two sons, okay? So two purposes there. And in this father's attitude and example, we see how we are to handle prodigal sons or daughters or loved ones, family members, friends, and not just, um, sorry, not just for parents, but how we are to handle these situations as siblings, aunts, uncles, grandparents. In my experience, most Christians know, most Christians that I know, um, handle the prodigal situation in their life the wrong way. One of the hardest things in life when it comes to social interactions is to show tough love. Most people struggle with both. But some, say, some can say the hard things, but when it comes to practice, it's hard to do the hard things. Does that make sense? So we can say the hard things, but then we wimp out when it comes time to do it, especially when it comes to loved ones, especially when it comes to sons and daughters and grandkids. So hopefully through today's study, we'll see what God's Word says about uh, how you and I as Christians are to handle prodigal people in our lives. And let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity now to study your word. Lord, I pray that you would uh, speak through me. Lord, that anything that's of me uh, would not be said, but help me, Lord, strengthen me, give me the words to say, uh, to share your heart to your people this morning, Lord, to share your words and, and your thoughts for them, for all of us, myself included. Lord, I pray that I would not step outside your bounds in your word, uh, that I would not me- make any mess-ups, but I would just simply and, and articulately uh, speak to your people, Lord. And I pray for all of us that are listening, Lord, that you would uh, humble our hearts and our ears, open them so that we may hear you speaking uh, to us today, Lord and that we would hear your heart, and we would hear application for each and every single one of us this morning. Like I prayed during worship, I pray again, Lord, that we would not leave this place without being touched by you this morning, without being touched, without hearing from you uh, for application in our lives, Lord. And so we ask that you would bless this time as we turn to your word. We pray that you would speak to us, Lord. We we don't want this to be a waste of our Sunday. We want it to be a true, uh, meaningful uh, uh, time with you, our Savior, and our Lord, and our God. 
We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, let's try again. Let's say amen. 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 All right. I don't want you guys falling asleep. I'm not as active and moving as Pastor Craig. Um, I don't have as funny jokes as Morgan. I used to, but he has taken that mantle and taken, and so I'm not going to compete. I beat the, the race against Pastor Craig, but I'm not going to compete against uh, Morgan. And so um, I'm going to be myself, okay? Be who I am. <laughs> you clap now, but I generally see quite a few, pe- quite a few people snoozing by the time I'm done, so, so we'll see. <laughs> All right, so hopefully you're in Luke 15, and we're going to start reading the parable together in verse 11. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now, before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Side note, it's kind of funny. As I was reading this and studying it, I thought, this kid is a millennial. I don't want to work. I don't want to do, I don't want to create anything. Give me money, right? You're, you're not dying. You're holding on to life. I don't like it. Give me the money now, right? I'm like, wow, that's, <laughs> that's my generation. Woo! <laughs> all right, verse 13. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living, partying, right? Having, having fun in the world. Verse 14. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. Verse 16, the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I, no longer, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Verse 20. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Verse 21. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Now, this parable starts with the kids being old enough to take care of themselves. So I want to stress that as we talk about prodigals in our families and in our our lives, uh, we're not talking about little kids that can't take care of themselves, that are dependent on mom and dad, right? So we're talking about those that are old enough to choose to go out and live on their own, to go out and do their own thing. Um, so this morning, I'd like us to take a, a or, or the first point for this morning is more of a preventative measure. Um, if you've been here at our church for any length of time, you know that, that we like to, we, we, we kind of try to do more preventative ministry, right? When we see trouble coming in, in someone's life and situations within the church body, you know, we try not to just say, oh, let, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We don't want to play with it, right? But if we see something coming, the Bible says that we as shepherds, our job is to uh, alert the people, to let you know, hey, we see this going on in your life, and, you know, we we don't want to just get involved in the nitty-gritty, but we want to warn you and let you know what can happen if you continue down that road, or if you continue struggling with this sin, or or whatever the case may be. Uh, The saying that I love that Pastor Craig said one time has always stuck with me, is that an, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Does that make sense? You guys tracking with me? An ounce of prevention, so a little bit of prevention, is better than a pound of cure, right? Just like with health, and we could go on and on about that, but it's better to take care of things before you have a reason to take care of it. And so that's kind of our mindset here, and, um, and so my first point this morning is don't create a prodigal doesn't really go in line with the parable, but it's one of, uh, something that we can kind of derive from it. And as we read God's word, you want to always say, Lord, how does this apply to me? Right? We don't want to read just to read. How does this apply in the 21st century? Right? 21st? We're not in the 20th. 21st century. All right. How does it apply to me, Kevin? How does it apply to me in the 21st century in this chaotic and crazy uh, society that we live in today in these communities in this country? Uh, So number one is don't create a prodigal. This more speaks to parents and guardians, but the same principle can apply in all relationships. So don't tune this out just because you're not a parent. All right. So don't create a prodigal. What I mean by this is to not live your life in a way 
that, people, that makes people not want to follow the Lord. God very rarely just appears to people and they accept him. Instead, he uses you and I to present his gospel. He uses you and I to pray for people. Now, I'm not saying he never appears. Don't hear that. I just said it's very rare. Because there's people over in the Middle East, Muslims, that Jesus just appears in a dream, right? And they go, okay, I'll follow you. But a majority of the time, it's done by God using us to share his gospel. Though sharing, uh, he, we do it through sharing it verbally, but mostly through how we live our lives. If we live out what we say we believe, that gives way more credit to what we say than when we say we believe something and we don't live it out, right? Our lives have way more of an impact than we even realize. And when we are not aware or concerned with how we're living our lives, we have great potential to turn people away from Christianity or to turn people off from God. When we get caught up and focused on ourself, on our marriage, on our relationship, when we get focused on our finances, when that becomes our main priority, our main focus in our, life, our lives, then that will turn people away from God. Not because those are our cares and concerns, but because we're not doing our part now to be aware of the people around us. And we're going to miss out on opportunities to share with them, to pray for them, to lead them, to help them, give them godly counsel. There's a lot of messed up people in the world, right? There's a lot in this room. Myself included, okay? We are messed up, whether you're two years old or 102, right? I mean, we're so me- we need advice. We need godly counsel, and we need to be ready to give it. Now, not meaning that we're going to be not messed up anymore, but we need to be ready to share our experiences and what God's doing in our lives so that we can be used by God. And other- but if we're so concerned with us, we're not going to be used in that way, and we're going to end up turning people off from God. Uh, Gandhi has been credited as to saying that he loves Christ, but not his people, because his people do not live like he did. I came across a story explaining that while studying law in South Africa, Gandhi read the Bible and very much liked what he was reading from Jesus and his sermons. He tried to go to a church in South Africa, but he was turned away because he was Indian. He was turned away because he wasn't what the church in South Africa wanted him to be. And that incident turned him away from Christianity. Studies show that we meet around 80,000 people in our lifetime. Now, obviously, that's a very conservative number. There's a lot of different factors and variables. If you're in sales, you're going to meet a lot more people than someone that is a janitor. <laughs> you know, it, it's, there's a lot. But, but on, let's just say for the sake of today, about 80,000 people we meet in our lifetime. And that is a lot of people, Okay. And each one of those people are left with some sort of an impression from you. doesn't matter if you met met them for a second or two. Now, not meaning that they're going to remember you their entire life, but in in that moment, you're going to make an impression on that person. Is it a good impression? Is it a bad impression? Or is it a neutral impression? Maybe it's just kind of like, they're who they are, and then you forget about them forever. Um, being in ministry and, and being on the business side of ministry, I have, to do, I have to make a lot of phone calls and I have to deal with vendors and people you know, taking care of our, our signage and uh, things that I can't do on my own. And one of the things that I always get a little worried about is that when they start to kind of procrastinate or drag their feet, you know, now I, as a pastor at a church, have to get on them and say, what are you doing? Example, I hate it, but it's necessary. Uh, half the, sign, the lights are out in our, our uh, monument sign out there, the big purple Calvary sign. And the lights, the little LED lights, are supposed to be un- covered under a five-year warranty. Okay, Not labor. I understand we've got to pay someone to install them, but the actual lights should be covered under warranty. So I have to call the sign company, and they just keep dragging their feet, dragging their feet. And so then I talk to the owner of it, and I said, look, this has been going on for two months. I'm not getting anywhere. They're supposed to be um, warranted, and you guys aren't giving me a clear answer as to why they're not going to be covered. If I have a clear answer, I understand. Right? So I'm not trying to be unreasonable. I'm trying to understand it. I'm trying to be, so give me a reason. They're just like, well, it's just sometimes they want to cover and sometimes they don't want to cover it. You know what I mean? No. 
I don't know what you mean. <laughs> that, that doesn't compute. That doesn't make sense. You don't offer a warranty and just, I don't know, today is a great day. Let's honor some warranties. You don't do that. And so I told them that. And then I, I had to be forceful and say, look, if this isn't taken care of, we're going to have to make complaints to the proper authorities and get this taken care of. And I hate saying that, to be honest with you guys, because I don't want to misrepresent Christ. But at the same time, people will try and take advantage of us because of Christ. And so we have to, have, we have to draw that line and be able to be firm and say the hard things to get things done while still doing our best not to, you know, I mean, I didn't cuss the guy out. That would have been bad, right? So my whole point, though, is not to complain to you guys, but my whole point is that th- there's, uh, d- having to deal with that stuff, I get worried about the impression that I'm going to leave with that person. Because it's a very real possibility that because of this situation, that person will never go to church. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that we don't do our best to get it done. I still had to do it. But I'm just saying that the, the point I want you guys to hear is, is just how real Sorry, my mic is falling off. But is how real that influence is or that impression is that we leave on people. Sometimes we can't help it. Like in this situation, I can't help that. We need to get it done and we need them to honor what we paid them to honor. But there's times where we can help what kind of an impression we have on those people. So with those numbers, 80,000 people, it's so important that we are living the way God has spelled out for us in his word. We have the potential to make such a huge impact on people by how we live, how we talk, how we interact with them. Ephesians 6.4 and Colossians 3.21, you can write those addresses down. I want to read those because I want to to take a moment to kind of turn and focus on on close relationships in our lives. But both those verses say, Fathers and it it pertains to mothers as well. Do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Parents, you don't want to push your kids away from Christ. Now, you don't want to compromise and just let them do whatever, right? But you don't want to be the reason that you push them away from, or why they get pushed away from Christ. Now, there's some factors that you can't help in your child's acceptance or rejection of Christ's provision for sin. But there are some major ones that you can How you live out Christianity at home is a major factor for your children. And if you are not careful and honest with your children, you will provoke them to anger or turn them off to Christ. The word provoke in both scriptures means, has has a few meanings, but two of them I want to talk about. One is to tease. Dads, moms, don't tease your children. Now, you hear that and you're like, duh, right? But there's things that we do playful, right? Well, not me. I'm not a dad, but you guys, you know, (laughs) but there's things that we do. We tease them, you know, like, and there's something in us that we just love to tease people. Can anyone agree? Come on, be honest. All right. I do. All right. We like teasing. (laughs) There's something in us that gets off on that. I grew up, I grew up being teased the majority of my life for being redhead, redheaded. In sixth grade, I got glasses my wonderful mom got me big ones. You know, I wanted baggy jeans. She got me jeans tighter than these. Who wears tight jeans? Kevin wears. You know, I grew up with that, right? <laughs> and it was horrible. But, so pity party on me, yes. But when I got the opportunity to tease someone, I loved it. I took advantage of it, right? So just because I got teased, you'd think it would do the opposite effect. No. When I got that power, yes, right? And I would make fun of people and tease them. You know, but we, we like to tease. There's something in us that, that just loves this. Now, with our children, most of the time, it's, we do it to be playful. Sometimes, though, it, it hurts. And we have to be aware of that. You have to be aware of your relationship with your kid, not to tease them. You know, not, not to unnecessarily give them um, rejection issues. <laughs> But God knows the types of damage, uh, sorry, but God knows the types of damage that happens because of teasing, and so he tells us to definitely not tease our children. Your children look up to everything you say and do. We all know how much of an impact those things have on our psychological and our physical health, and that in turn affects our view of God since he is our father. The word provoke also has a connection to the word torture. 
It's kind of weird. You wouldn't think that, but I looked it up. And if you look under the definition of torture, one of the synonyms for that is provoke. Because you're kind of like provoking, like, come on, come on, you're, you're, you're doing something to kind of stir up frustration or anger, and, and that can be a form of torture for people. I know that, hopefully, when we say torture our kids, we don't want to torture our kids, we know that, doesn't mean, we know that means not to waterboard them, <laughs> right? We know that means not to cattle prod them, yeah, right? <laughs> Some kids need it, but we don't do that. Just kidding. But what he means here, what he means by that is, to not to, is don't torture your kids with unrealistic expectations or higher standards for them than for yourself. A great temptation for parents is to mold their kids into who they think they should be, living out their glory days through their kids, making them, I want you to be a doctor, right? And we've heard that all our lives. People always kind of joke about it, but it's so true. I want you to be a doctor. I want you to be a lawyer. If you're not a Christian, I want you to, to you know, do this, to do that. But God has tasked you, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, with helping your child to grow into and become the man or woman that God wants them to be. John Corson said it like this, kids should not be molded, but unfolded. Ew, yes. Should not be molded, but unfolded. Dad, you might have been the best football player that ever lived in high school and you would have made it to the pros if you hadn't blown out your knee. Because I'm sure there's a lot of us out there, a lot of you out there, that feel that way. But that doesn't mean that your kid will. I do need to say that we have to be careful not to go to the other extreme and allow our kids to just do whatever they want. Especially in this society. I feel pretty boy <laughs> no <laughs> you know they need direction i have a, a a male cousin who is around my age we're not close we don't talk at all but uh we used to uh, his mom my aunt used to watch us when we were really young when we lived in california when i was like four or five six seven um but when <laughs> when he was really young he was really into tap dancing now there's nothing wrong with tap dancing in fact it can be kind of cool Sometimes, right? You hear that tapping and clicking and see them, you know, get into it and stuff. It can be cool. Um, but when you're a kid and you're into tap dancing and you do all the, the uh, competitions and stuff, you generally dress in tight clothing or leotards. Um, and so my cousin was into that. Okay, that's cool. Then he wanted to get his ear pierced. Ear. One ear pierced. So do you know what everyone made fun of him for? Can you track with me here? No? Okay, tap dancing, one ear, hi, right? That's what everyone said he was, and everyone made fun of him. Now, he didn't turn out that way, as far as I know, but he needed some... In fact, now, he's, he's whiter than me. He's so white, but he's got dreads, like, down to his butt. At least a couple of years ago he did, which is kind of cool. And he's got a big old dragon coming out of here. You know? So he's definitely gone to the other extreme. <laughs> okay? I was going to show a picture, but I'm sure I'll offend somebody if I show it. But, I mean, it's just weird, crazy, right? And, uh, and so him and I don't really click. <laughs> we don't connect very well. But my point is, is not to make fun of my cousin, but to show that he needed male direction in his life. Not that he shouldn't have tap danced, but he needed to help unfold that Say, son, do you really want to dance around in tight clothing? Do you really want to have one earring? Do you know what the world says that means? Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not going to let you do that for your sake, for your health. He needed that direction. His dad, remember, he was a big burly guy, big old mustache. I always wanted a mustache like him. I can't do it. But he's just like, hey, how's it going? And he got a deep voice. And I'm like, how did that happen? You know, but he, di he, he didn't guide him and direct him. So our kid, what I'm saying is, sorry, is our kids need direction. You want to help unfold them. They might be into ballet as a boy. They might be into it, but you as the dad need to talk with him and need to guide him and direct him. Maybe he's into football and all dads are like, yeah, right? But guide him and direct him in that. Don't let him just take it and run with it. Be there. Be a part of their life. Moms, you too. Be a part of their lives. They need to be unfolded and, and, and guided and not just let them figure it all out on their own.
You need to be careful, like I said, to not live your glory days through your children. When you do, and it's just not what your child is into, you're going to push them away. The end of Colossians 3.21 says that they will become discouraged. I can't live up to my dad's standards, my mom's standards. I I can't be perfect. I'm never going to do it good enough. It's never going to be good enough. I'm always going to fail. I'm I'm horrible. You don't want to cause your kid to feel that. Now, they might feel that on their own because they're human, but you don't want to cause them to feel that. You want to do your very best to not discourage them. Your children are sensitive to whether or not you are proud of who they are or if you're trying to make them into someone that they're not, and they become discouraged. And this, in turn, affects their view of God and living for Him. I just heard this on Friday on on the radio, but it says that you, and this is talking about Christians living for God, you are the exact parent that your child needs. God gave you that child. Whether he was an, oops, I'm pregnant, or planned, he or she. God gave them to you either way. And you're tasked with raising them the way that God wants them to be raised as a Christian. The rest of Ephesians 6, 4 says to bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Proverbs 22, 6 says to train your child up in the way of the Lord. So to sum all this up, Don't unnecessarily give your children a reason to walk away from the Lord. Don't put a heavy burden on them and and make them be who you want them to be because they're most likely going to rebel against that. But don't be easy on them and allow them to do whatever they want. They will get into trouble. They'll get caught up in worldly interests that steer them away from the Lord. So be involved in your kid. Don't create a prodigal. So, this, so back to the parable, the younger of two sons comes to his dad and demands his share of the inheritance. That's in verse 12. And what does the father do? He gives it to him. This was very uncommon back then because the father would traditionally, traditionally disperse their inheritance uh, after they died. They would set up everything, kind of like a will, right, to be taken care of once they died. Or if they chose to retire early, they would disperse it early. But you didn't have kids coming and saying, I want it now, and you give it to them. In fact, rebellious sons, according to the law in Deuteronomy, a rebellious son or daughter, if they were disobedient and rebellious, they just wouldn't get it. They're just constantly, no, 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 I want to do my... You know what God's law said to do with them? Stone them. One area, put them up on a tree. Hang them for, to be an example. We don't teach on that in the church, right? <laughs> and we're not saying to do it. We're in the age of grace, right? But that's how serious God was about obedience. And so this son in this parable, and Jesus is sharing it so we can assume that this son is a Jewish son. They would have known the law. But what does the father do? He gives it to him. And it's showing our father's heart. That he doesn't give us what we deserve, but he blesses us. He'll give us the things that we ask for. I mean, not everything, but even when they hurt us, he allows us to have them, to teach us not to do that. But the son showed an arrogant disregard for his father's authority as the head of the family. And yet the father went ahead and gave it to him. And what did the son do? He went and spent it on worldly pleasures, and he spent it all. But notice that the father gave him the inheritance and let the son go. And this is our second point this morning. Number two, let them go. So don't create a prodigal, but then when they're, if there is one, we have to let them go. First, I want us to see that these sons were old enough, as I said at the beginning, to take care of themselves. So I'm not saying that if your kid's like 13, 14, I don't want to live for God, then you're out on your own. Figure life out. (laughs) No, that's not what I'm saying. But when they're 18, and they want to go on their own, I mean, hopefully you're doing your best to teach them, to train them about finances and relationships and how to do things the right way, the biblical way. But there comes a time where your kid might just say, you know what, I I don't care, I want to go. And what did this father do? He let him go. The father did not try and coerce the son into staying and living right. He did not try to convince him to live for the Lord. He did not try to manipulate or guilt trip his son into making the right decision. The father recognized that he was dealing with a human being who had a will of their own. 
And when this child, using their free will, decided to move out, the father did not stop him. Sometimes we try too hard to keep people living for God. Now, it's better than not trying at all, so don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we're not to talk. We're not to try and help. But when they've made their decision, we try too hard to make them change their mind. I've done it many times in my life. But there are times when there's no convincing a person and they are, that, and they are going to do what they want to do. And we need to respect that decision and stop wasting our time and effort. There comes a time when we need to simply let go and let that person live on their own. God told Jeremiah twice in the book of Jeremiah to stop praying for the Jewish people. God had spoken to them, given them signs, and they still refused to repent. And so God let go, in a sense. He didn't give up on them. He didn't stop pursuing them. He, he just, but he stopped trying to convince them because they had made up their own stubborn minds. Sometimes, like the father in this parable, we need to just let go and let our stubborn kids or people in our lives go on and figure it out on their own. I can think of a handful of people that I've tried to convince not to turn away from the Lord, not to go do their own thing. I tried to reason with them. I spelled it out. I did my best to convince. I even tried to lay guilt trips. (laughs) I know none of you do that. Moms. Mm -mm. (laughs) See how quiet that is? (laughs) Excuse me? I do too. But in the end, they still did what they wanted to do. And that is so hard for us when we care for someone. But don't you think that this father cared for his son? And yet he recognized that there was no convincing his son, and so the father let his son make his own decisions. When we hold people back from making their own decisions, even if it's for their own good, it has a tendency to backfire on us. As hard as it can be for us, like the father in this parable, we need to let them go and let them experience the hardness of this life on their own. Now, I'm not saying to force them out and make them learn the hard way, But if your kid or friend, if they want to experience the world and what it has to offer, and they choose to do so, then don't force them to stay. Instead, let them go and pray for them. Which brings me to the third point this morning. Number three, hands off. So number one, don't create a prodigal. Number two, let go. (laughs) Blackout. <laughs> I said hands off and I look at Tina and Casey and Tina's uh, Casey's like, <laughs> so, <laughs> so distracting me. Okay, number one, don't create a prodigal. Number two, let go. And number three, hands off. Look at verses uh, 13 through 21 of Luke 15. We'll read it together. A few days later, the, young, the younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave anything to him. Other versions say he started eating the food that he gave the pigs. Verse 17, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. What turned the son around? Experiencing the harshness of this world. The father did not chase after him. The father did not go and rescue his son. He didn't send money to him. He wasn't, not that any moms here do this, but he wasn't a mom who snuck things to him. Oh, your father doesn't need to know. Here, here's, here's a Costco thing of toilet paper. You're good to go, right? You know? Oh, here, let me buy you lunch. You know? like, he didn't do even that. Too many of us Christians, we don't handle our prodigals the right way. When our friend or child or family member turns away from the Lord and they start to experience hardships, we run to rescue them. They leave and make their own decisions and then get into trouble, either financially or with the law or both or with relationships, and then we run to rescue them. What brought the son to his senses? His dad helping him out? His dad bailing him out? His dad giving him a loan? 
No, it was being humbled and crushed by this world. I don't think that we always understand how humiliated this son was. And when we have a loved one, we want to do everything we can to keep them from making mistakes. We want to do everything we can to keep them from feeling humiliated and ashamed. But they need to feel that. They need to learn that. If they're the ones that are turning away and pursuing their own things instead of God. Not only did he have nothing to show for his decision to live on his own and spend his wealth, But he was forced to stoop so low that he was not only feeding pigs, but eating their food. To a Jew, feeding pigs was bad enough. But to have to eat the food that you're feeding them, that was the lowest of lows. How many of us would have, you don't have to raise your hands, but think, how many of us would have stepped in to help this son if he were ours? How many of us would have stepped in and prevented him from having to stoop so low? Many people, many of us would, and we do. And that is why our children, our family members, our friends, do not come to their senses and turn back to Christ. This son did not come to his senses, uh, did not just all of a sudden come, but he had to hit rock bottom. Do you hear that? He had to hit rock bottom to turn around. And some of us know that through experience. We've had to hit rock bottom. And that's why we want to help prevent our loved ones from having to experience that. Now, if they, if they respond and they listen, amen. That's great. But there are still those that are going to say, you know what? You're not me, right? You don't, how many of you heard this? You don't understand. You're old, right? <laughs> there are so many prodigals that aren't prodigal <laughs> because they're prevented from hitting rock bottom. What I mean by that is that they don't, they don't finish out the prodigal process of coming back but they don't return because they're they're not prevented i mean they don't return because they are prevented from hitting rock bottom mom dad guardian if your kid is out on their own living for and pursuing worldly pleasures don't support them don't sneak it we have to remember and understand that tough love is love The ultimate Father, God, allows us to hit rock bottom, allows us to face and endure the consequences of our sin. Does he do it to hurt us? No. To show us our need for him and to allow us to choose to follow him. So then why would you and I be any different? If that's what the ultimate Father does and allows, why should we be any different and not allow that for the loved ones in our lives? Why is it that God shows tough love, but we think if we just love and support them, they'll turn around? I have never seen, maybe you guys have, but in my experience, I have never seen a child or backslidden Christian turn back to Christ because their parents or friends enabled them and rescued them and prevented them from facing the harshness of this world. I've only seen it prolonged, and it keeps going and going. And they eventually turn on you and blame you for their predicament. But we need to let go and keep our hands off of their lives and situation. And instead, we need to pray for them. We need to pray that God does whatever it takes to bring that person back to him or to him. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 5.5 and 1 Timothy 1.20. He talks about handing rebellious Christians over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. That's the tough love we need to show our rebellious loved ones. It's in the Bible. We can't argue against it. Well, we can, but we're not going to win. We need to pray that God will allow them to be humbled and broken to the point that their flesh is destroyed and no longer rules. Now, what we mean by that, Pastor Craig has taught on it multiple times, but when you hand someone over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, it's not like, here's Satan, take them, right? You're just saying, Lord, I surrender, I let go, and I pray that you allow whatever needs to happen to this person to happen so that they will return to you, so that they'll give their life to you. Because if not, that person is going to go to hell for eternity. If they don't give their lives to Christ, they don't surrender to him, that's where they're going to spend an eternity. And so we hand them over for their their spiritual flesh 
to be crushed by this world. And who's the king of this world right now? Who's the ruler of this world right now? Satan. So do you understand what that means to hand someone over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh? You're not making a deal with Satan. You're just allowing whatever needs to happen to this person, to this loved one, to happen for the sake of their soul and their eternity. In the situation in 1 Timothy 1.20, is to teach Hymenaeus and Alexander to not blaspheme the name of the Lord. So it's not even that they were necessarily turning away or backsliding, but they're blaspheming the name of the Lord, misusing his name, misrepresenting his name. And so Paul prayed that. God's ways are not our ways. It doesn't make sense, and it goes against all we feel and think to just let someone ruin their lives. But we need to trust God and obey his word and follow the examples in his word on how to handle these people. Now, I'm not saying that we don't love these people. I'm not saying that we don't speak the truth to these people. I'm not saying to ignore them and hope and pray for the worst for them. I'm saying to look at this parable given by Jesus and see how the father handled his rebellious son. And what was the outcome? The son realized his need and came home. And did the father rub it in his face and scold him and guilt him when he came home? No. He rejoiced that his son was, that had realized how foolish he had been and returned home. And it's the same for you and I. When we see them heading down that path of destruction, we see them ruining their lives, and they turn around, that is such a great joy. It's so much better, it's such a better feeling than when we help them and we enable them. I want to also talk about real quick is how do we know that this son was truly humble and repentant? How do we know that this son wasn't trying to manipulate his father into helping him out and getting more money for more pleasure? Because that happens. Our son, our daughter, our loved one, oh yes, I've given my life back to Christ. Hey, I need a place to live. right? Hey, I really need some help financially. I'm going to go to jail. You don't want me to go to jail. right? Because I'm returning back to God. Well, you've got to look at their attitude and how they're starting to live their life. Verses 17 through 19 of Luke 15. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both you and heaven, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as your son. Please take me back as I was before. Take me back as a hired servant. The son was willing to be a servant, Another side point this morning is that the prodigals in our life will try and take advantage of us. At times they're going to fake repent just so that things will go easy for them. They'll even go as far as to apologize and seek forgiveness. But what is the real proof that they've realized their need to turn around? That they come back humble, not seeking money, not seeking rescue. They just simply come back, admit their mistakes, and ask for forgiveness with no strings attached. They're not seeking anything from you. They're not trying to get anything from you. Now, yeah, they're probably hoping for it, but that's not their motive. Their motive is just to make things right. What did the son say in verses 18 and 19? Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. He wasn't seeking to have his bank account replenished. He wasn't seeking to eat better food than the pigs. He wasn't even hoping to come back and simply live at home. Now those were real, let me put it this way, those were real hopes and thoughts in his mind, but that wasn't his motive for returning home. He, real, he truly realized he screwed things up and he wanted to make them right. A lot of times we see what we want to see in our loved ones, but we have to ask God to enable us to have honest eyes and make sure that this person isn't trying to pull the wool over our eyes. But you can always tell a humble, repentant person because they will come home broken and they'll get back into the body of Christ. Does this mean that every prodigal will return? Every prodigal will return? No. But it does mean that you are, were, obedient more to Christ than to yourself, and that you recognize that you cannot save anyone from anything. Only God can truly do that. And when we let go and keep our hands off and entrust these people to God, when we stop funding their sinful lifestyles, when we stop showing approval of their lifestyles by supporting them and just accepting them the way they are, 
then they have a better chance at turning to the Lord than if we try and make it happen in our, in our own strength. I can confidently say that when we try in our own strength, we will fail and screw things up. Instead, we need to wait on the Lord and pray, pray, and pray. We say we believe in the power of prayer, but when it comes to our loved ones, all of a sudden, mm, yeah, pray, but I got to help them. I have to give to them. I have to enable them. They're, they're going to live on the streets. I got to give them a place to live. We'll pray for them. Oh, I'm praying as I give them a place to live. And I recognize that this is, a lot of people view this, this part of Christianity as, well, it's easier for you because you don't have kids. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> I'll be honest, it is. I don't have kids. But I have a brother that has walked away from the Lord. I have family members that don't live for the Lord. And so I know the hurt and I know the pain. My brother, many of you know him. I don't think he listens to my teaching, so I'm safe. Just kidding. I'd say it anyways. But he was very involved here for a number of years. But he got caught up in pride and wanted to live on his own and do his own thing. And so he moved out to another state on his own. And within the first couple of weeks, he fell away from the Lord. He was teaching youth group at times. He was doing Bible studies. So on the outward, he was doing all the right things. But then within a matter of weeks, he went down the tubes and started partying, drinking, sex, all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, he chose to get married to someone, um, a, a girl. He <laughs> chose to get married to a girl who says they're Christian, but from what we've seen and what we can tell, right, judged by fruit, I don't know if they're really that strong of a Christian or Christian at all. And so I had to tell him, I cannot support you in this decision because you're in rebellion to Christ. And you're making a life-changing decision while being in rebellion to Christ. Not that you can't marry, I don't know this, but it's nothing to do with the person. It has to do with where you are in life and where you are at with your relationship with the Lord. And I asked him too, point blank, do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? The way that you're living, because we judge by fruit, we don't know the heart. And his fruit is everything opposite of a Christian. And he said, I don't know. He said, it concerns me, but not, he was honest, he said, it concerns me, but not enough to change right now. And that's a scary place to be. And that's sad. And that's really hard for a, uh, me as a brother to see that happen. And so I made the tough decision. I said, I cannot support you in this. I'm not going to go to your wedding while you're in this lifestyle. And I, my family says they don't do it, but I've been blackballed by my family because I do not support my brother in marriage. Now they love me, I, they still see me and stuff, but as soon as that topic comes up, everyone's on me, like white on rice. Why didn't you do it? Why, did, why would God have you do it? Why would, it's my opinion. I'm not telling you guys to do that. I don't tell anyone else to do that. I say you pray and you hear from God and you do what the Bible says to do and that's what I heard from the Lord. And so my point is that, yeah, I don't have kids, but I have loved ones that have fallen away. And the Bible applies to you as a parent just as much as to me as a sibling. When it comes down to it, my point is that we have to follow the Bible. If the Bible is not true to us, if God's word is not true to us, then what kind of Christianity are we living? Because everything we believe in is based, is rooted in the Bible. So either it's true or it's not. And if it's true, that means everything in it is true. Right. And everything in it is how we are to live our lives. Exactly. But I have good news. When we pray and pray and pray and commit to praying, there is power. There's two people in my life, and I'm just going to give, a, I'm not going to go into detail because we're running out of time. But two people that I committed to pray for daily that God would break them of their flesh and that they would see their need for a Savior, and they both came to know the Lord. One of them within a matter of weeks, the other one within a matter of years, <laughs> but it took time. Now, one, the first one ended up falling away from the Lord, but that doesn't negate the power of prayer. So pray for that prodigal person in your life. Pray for them. Don't enable. Don't fund them. Cut it off. Do the hard thing, and then just commit to pray and entrust them to the Lord. I read this quote, search for a person who claims to have found Christ apart from someone else's prayer and your search may go on forever. 
Search for a person who claims to have found Christ apart from someone else's prayer, and your search may go on forever. God uses our prayers. I don't understand it. I, I don't comprehend it. But the evidence is there. When you commit to pray, things happen. And I was going to read to you an excerpt from the story. From, I don't have time, so I won't. But it's Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. It's not a story. It's, a, it's a, kind of like a biography of um, the Brooklyn Tabernacle. It's a church in New York, I think in Brooklyn. Huge church. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking someone told me they've been there. But Pastor Jim Cimbala, he's a pastor, a successful church, thousands of people. Their prayer night, their Wednesday night, Tuesday night prayer night, they've got like tw- anywhere from twelve to 1,700 people there yeah. praying. And not just sitting there watching, actively engaging in prayer together. Okay. Yeah, well, I was just going based off of his numbers. But, um, but he, just to real quick to summarize what, he's, what I'm saying is that so here's a successful pastor. He's seen God do miracles, mighty things. His daughter fell away from the Lord and moved out. And he tried to convince. He tried to coerce. He tried to manipulate. He tried to get her to, to not do what she was doing. He tried and tried and tried. And then finally one day he said, I have to do what I tell other people to do. He cut off all contact with her. His firstborn, his daughter, cut off all contact with her. And he just committed to pray. Christmas time, they were opening presents. She wasn't there. He said it was depressing. But they, he didn't... Um, uh, oh, I lost the word. Waver. The other word for waver. Compromise. He didn't compromise. He didn't say, okay, it's Christmas. Let's make it an exception. He cut it off, and then they committed to pray. And in so doing, one night she had this dream just to make it really quick and short, she had a dream that she was uh, standing at the edge of an abyss and there was no end to it. And she knew if she fell in it, I think if I remember correctly, she was going to keep falling forever and it scared her to death. Well, that very same night, the entire church prayer meeting was praying for her. And so she came home broken, humble, crying, saying, Daddy, I'm so sorry. I've sinned, it's basically said what the prodigal son said, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you. Please forgive me. So my point is, is that a lot of times we hear these things, we're like, oh, that's good for you. Yeah, it's good in theory. But it works. So if you have a prodigal person in your life, let them go, keep your hands off, and commit to pray for them. Pray daily. Put it on an index card. Put it somewhere on a piece of paper. Write it on your mirror. I don't know. Pray for so-and-so. Pray that they will be humbled and broken and give their lives to Christ. That's all we can really do. So number one, don't be a reason why your, your son or why that person is a prodigal. Number two, let them go. And number three, keep your hands off the situation and trust the Lord. Amen.
blessed week, everybody. Have a happy 4th of July.